All right. So it looks like the attendee number is, is leveling off right now. So, so once again, welcome everyone um, to our fourth installment of the Analytics Enthusiast webinar series. Um, for those of you that are new, um, the Analytics Enthusiast group uh, brings together uh, quantitative data, marketing research uh, professionals, really to share ideas, insights, perspectives uh, with others um, through a, a thought leadership community. Um, and and these, these events, primarily the webinars right now, um, are, are filled up with you know, presentations, roundtable discussions, panels like we have today um, for enthusiastic professionals in the industry um, to, to network. So hopefully um, you, you do some connections via LinkedIn since we're virtual still right now um, with, with some of our panelists or, or each other. Um, and, uh, and really discuss, you know, kind of strategy, topics, um, you know, solutions, things uh, that you're working on kind of openly with peers and, and other individuals in the industry. So we really appreciate everybody uh, attending today. We have a wonderful panel um, that is, is coming together uh, to discuss uh, ethical AI today. Um, please utilize the uh, platform to send questions in. So we'll be monitoring uh, your questions um, and we can disperse them throughout the the conversation or we'll have some QA at the end. So if you have questions that you'd like to, to hear thoughts from our panel, uh, please send them through. Um, and then if you'd like to be involved with uh, the analytics enthusiasts at all, um, please feel free to reach out um, at anal analytics enthusiasts at birchworks.com. Um, so we, we love to, to get more people involved. So without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Ari, and you can take it away. Hey, thanks, John. And uh, special thanks to the panelists and people listening live and imagine a bunch of people are going to be watching the recording. So thank you all. So I am Ari Kaplan, Global AI Evangelist at Data Robot. Been there uh, almost three years and before then worked uh, all over the AI space and data si uh, science space. Uh, actually, one of the companies I worked at was uh, Nielsen and we share the same office building as Birchworth. So been a big fan. Uh, Know Linda, that you know, one of the founders, and very uh, you know respected organization in this field. So thanks again for putting this together. Um, uh, I'll have the other panelists introduce themselves, and you know, just to you know kick things off, that this topic is extremely timely. The world is changing. The uh, not just the world, but the field of AI is like moving forward very rapidly, and uh, you know part of my uh, evangelist role is talking to customers and prospects and industry analysts all over and the transparency um, and trust of AI is you know, arguably number one but certainly uh, top two or three of every conversation I have. MLOps is big but how do you trust uh, what is fairness, bias and how do you work ethically? Our theme is really excited have this extraordinary uh, panel uh, 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 talk about. But with that, why don't we uh, go and have the panelists just uh, introduce themselves all, uh, and this time go through alphabetically by first name. So uh, uh, Fiona. Yeah, sure. Uh, so hi, my name is Fiona J. McAvoy. Um, I am a, a writer, a blogger, and kind of general talking head when it comes to the issue of AI ethics. I've been writing about it for about five or six years now. And um, I, I'm kind of maybe different to some of the other panelists in that I come at it uh, from a, my background is in philosophy and humanities. And so I, I very much come at it as, as kind of a lay person. I'm not, a, I'm not a technical person, but I'm just interested in the ways in which AI touches regular people's lives and what the impact is for good or for bad. So, so that's what I, I write about. Um, I'm normally based in San Francisco. I should, I should say the reason it's dark behind me is because I'm currently in the UK. Um, so yeah, delighted to be here today and, and really excited for this discussion. Great, thanks. Um, Hania? Uh, so I'm Hania Mahmoudian, uh, Global A, this is the data robot. Um, I run the team called uh, Applied AI Ethics uh, with the focus on tackling use cases uh, that we consider sensitive, that, um, you know, impact the uh, livelihood of people. Uh, we are part of a gr uh, bigger group called Trusted AI Center of Excellence. Great, well, welcome, and uh, Lindsay? Hi, yeah, I'm Lindsay Zulaga. I'm the Chief Data Scientist at HireVue. 
My background is in physics, so I spent the early days of my career doing academic research and then transitioned into data science when I got a job in the quote real world um, and started working in the healthcare space. I've, I've been at Hireview for about five years, which is a platform that helps companies um, and job candidates find the right fit through things like chat engagement, um, interview scheduling, video interviewing, assessments, and coding challenges. Um, so, you know, obviously fairness is a big part of what we think about, and um, I'm interested in kind of how fairness is defined for different use cases and trying to solidify metrics and best practices for data scientists to follow. Um, we've also done several third-party algorithmic audits which have varied quite a bit in nature um, but that that area is a big interest for me right now as well that's great and we'll yeah, we'll jump into the uh, auditing in, in a little bit which is super fascinating um you know maybe as a first question you know when, when i talk ai ethics and fairness and bias kind of means 10 things to 10 different people so who, who want who wants to go first to define like AI ethics, fairness bias? Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, Fiona. I mean, I mean, I would never be so bold as to try to define fairness, uh, and 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 um, as I'm sure we will discover through the course of this conversation, it is. Uh, an extremely large task that a lot of brain power is currently going into, and you know there are there are tons of different definitions and um, and and ways of articulating what fairness is, and and that is actually you know it's a big problem, uh, and I think companies need to think about what it means for them in terms of their value structures, but also um, which which definition or which approach to fairness is the most suitable. For their own customer base or those people that they interact with. Um, I, I don't work, as, as I said at the top, I don't work, luckily I don't work in defining issues of fairness, but um, one thing I would say um, that it's really important to remember when we're talking about this is that historically people, customers, human beings have been um, good at defining what they believe fairness is in terms of the way that they are treated. And so uh, I think it's all very well having people like me and, and professional ethicists and technical people uh, and people indeed across di disciplines in back rooms trying to think about this problem on a kind of academic level and then trying to put that into practice. Uh, I think, and, and one of the things I write about is it's really important that we continue to engage regular people and to solicit their feedback on what they believe is fair and build that into to ethical design. Wonderful. Uh, Lindsay, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I can add a little from just kind of the applied perspective. Um, so when we say, you know, for, for those who aren't very familiar with the area of why, why is fairness so complicated? Um, an example would be like um, a difficult question, like if um, you show, you know, you have a job posting and you're showing it online, would should that job posting be equally likely to be shown to men as women? Or is it fair to say that it should be equally likely to be shown to a person who's qualified for that job regardless of their gender. So those are kind of two different notions of what fairness could, could mean. Um, like in hiring, what I, I mainly focus on, we're really lucky to kind of benefit from this being an area that's been around for many decades. Um, there are, you know, regulations and laws around um, what's called adverse impact. So that that kind of, those metrics serve as kind of a guiding light for us. So that means that we're concerned with what's called um, like demographic parity or just group differences in outcomes and ensuring that they aren't too big. So we have some assessment, are men scoring higher than women in a significant way? Um, uh, that is um, obviously like not doing anything illegal is of primary concern. And so it's nice as a data scientist to have some where to start. Um, but those standards are like about 50 years old and probably need to be revisited. And I'm not sure if or when that will ever happen. So we we try to take a broader view and, and be involved in, um, you know, the algorithmic fairness research and understanding other metrics, like how accurate is the algorithm for different groups? 
that doesn't have anything to do with um, with the differences in, in uh, group outcomes, but um, it's, it's a different way of looking at it. And we've even like engineered some of our own metrics that work well for our use case. So, you know, the answer is obviously there's not a clear definition. And I think um, that's what makes it an interesting area, but very challenging. And, and I think we have to kind of look at different use cases um, separately to try to figure out what what are good metrics to start with or to you know even think about or look at just to start kind of moving the needle um, in, in measuring these things. Yeah, great thoughts and yeah I love uh, everything you say and especially like the applied you know AI how, how does it get applied in real life uh, definition or none. Uh, and yeah I heard I hear you speak a lot heard you speak uh, was it just last week on some of the subjects uh, you know what are your thoughts like uh, defining ai ethics and fairness and bias um so you know fiona and Lindsay really um kind of covered the area of you know we don't have a one size fits all for when it comes to um you know defining fairness you know you really need to look at each use case individually and try to Kind of come up with a metric or a definition that's uh, really appropriate for that use case. But when we are thinking about AI ethics, um, bias and fairness is one aspect of it. You know, you need to think about the whole AI life cycle and think about at every step, at every stage of the process, you need to make want to make sure that it's built responsibly, uh, you know, depending on your organization's value uh, at each step. Um, those values are incorporated in the process. You can think of, you know, governance part of it, you know, model accuracy, a very simple thing that's also part of the ethics. Is it ethical to, for example, deploy a model that's not accurate enough? So there, at each stage, we need to think about what ethics means for that uh, in the process. And usually you would have that in the form of different frameworks that we have, whether if it's around data ethics, or whether if it's around AI ethics, there are many uh, different frameworks that, you know, we encourage organizations to really think about even building their own framework that's relevant to their organization. That's great. And why don't we go, uh, you know, keep going with you and, and, you know, you're talking about frameworks and systems. Like what, what are some ways that companies like implement, whether systems are uh, hand coded to like detect you know, let's just say bias, uh, you know, detect it in the data, detect it in the model, detect it in how it's um, being communicated and implemented. Um, so that's, you know, first of all, you know, we touched about um, first defining what fairness metric is relevant, what fairness means to their um, use case, but definitely having uh, a process in place that, you know, evaluating the data quality side of it, uh, again, uh, right now we are kind of touching based on bias and fairness side of it. Is our data um, rich enough or is our data representative enough of the population that we are um, trying to look at? Um, you know, evaluating our models and also, um, you know, models, uh, you know, uh, decreasing their performance over time. So it's essential to have the monitoring aspect of it to kind of over time uh, making sure that you're uh, monitoring the model and evaluating its behavior and its uh, towards different groups. So we would be able to, you know, if there are concerns, we would be able to uh, tackle it right away. Very good. Uh, either, of, either of you wanted to add on to that? I would just, I would just agree and say that like some of the work that I did a few years ago and some of the things I wrote about um, was looking at this issue of where data comes from um, and, and not just looking at it, I guess, uh, quantitatively for, for um, evidence of bias or misrepresentation, but also thinking about, depending on what kind of data you're dealing with, but sometimes thinking about what socio-economic historical context it was collected in. And uh, there's an example which I'm sure um, some people already know of, which is um, AI being used for predictive policing and, and using historical arrest records to predict where crime is going to be. But obviously, if you if you kind of take a step back and zoom out on that and think about um, some of the human biases that went into the collection of this data, and I'm thinking specifically of some parts, you know, some cities and some countries where the police target 
particular populations. Um, what the AI was doing was obviously assuming that the, the future will mimic the past and deploying police to areas that were already historically over-policed and obviously as a corollary to that ignoring areas um, where obviously crimes may happen but they aren't being detected at the same rate because of this kind of um, strange and warped deployment and so I mean it's easy to say and it's hard to do but having a, a, an awareness of just how data is collected what context it was collected who by for what purpose um, is obviously incredibly important as we use more and more and more of it in in you know and the ubiquity of ai is obviously something that we're, we're talking about this for that reason Great. yeah I would, I would just add a little bit of what both of you said i mean i think you cannot poke and prod and audit too much really <laughs> like it's just so complicated that often a model is built in one situation it's deployed in a slightly different situation um just following up to make sure it's behaving in the way that's expected is so important and i i am a mathy person so i often i talked about metrics you know like we can define metrics and and satisfy them but that is obviously not everything falls under that umbrella um like you're saying fiona like getting the way that you gather data and questioning um where this data come from comes from and how um how it may skew the algorithm, propagate human bias. Obviously, human bias is a huge thing in hiring. So, um, so thinking about kind of improving upon the past without replicating those those patterns um, is really important to me as well. Yeah, and I love your um, you know hire view, and that's like one of the best cases for this uh, you know discussion group uh, of all that. But you had brought up a couple times auditing, and on a prior call. We're talking about uh, your experience with Orca and getting audited. Can, can you tell some of that story? Yeah, um, yeah. I mentioned we we did four audits uh, last year. Orca was the first and kind of most public. Um, so it, it is run by Kathy O'Neill, who wrote uh, the book Weapons of Math Destruction, that, that was very popular in I think it was 2016. Um, it, it was interesting to see with the different audits, how people are approaching the area and they were all different. <laughs> um, so what does an algorithmic audit mean? That's not really not really standardized yet. Um, you know, as generally like as an algorithmic auditor, Kathy and her team, they, they know a lot about data science and how algorithms are applied, but um, in any situation they go into, they have to learn a lot about the use case specifics. So for us, that's hiring or um, kind of assessment for jobs and, and the world of industrial organizational psychology was is, is kind of a new area for them. And they take a really holistic look, which I think is really important. Um, uh, I think some people did expect that Kathy, being a data scientist, she would kind of get into the code only. Um, and I think it's it's great that they didn't. You know, they they really um with with that particular audit they interviewed many people that use the system all sorts of stakeholders that work for HireVue, that work for our customers job candidates minority job candidates to understand what their concerns are and um and the goal of the audit is to address um a lot of the you know the more urgent concerns and so for us some of those concerns are perceived and some were real which is interesting you know when people hear you're using AI on my video interview. There's a lot of fear around what that might mean. Um, so, so, so a lot of you know, re we shared a lot of research that we do. They asked a lot of really hard questions. We worked on kind of addressing and co coming out um, with a report in the end, showing kind of what we worked on and what we're we're all we're always working on to kind of move the needle. Um, you know. And, and some of it is around just us being more transparent and open about what's going on, right? If you're taking a recording yourself in a job interview, to be clear, is, is machine learning being used on this interview or not? Because a lot of our customers do not uh, use that product. Um, and, and what is it paying attention to? Our, our models only pay attention to language now. Um, so making those things clear actually helps people feel a lot more comfortable. Um, you know, it's, it's 
we're really happy with the results of the audits and um you know it is it's always good to have kind of have a complete third party to bounce ideas off of and um validate what you're doing or speak to it publicly but also you know ask ha ask the hard questions because we're always trying to do that internally as well yeah but very interesting and like right before you were talking um a, a similar question from the audience came in and <laughs> which is a great follow-up which is uh you know on a practical operational level are there some standards evolving to test and ascertain if the data we use and models we build are ethical and fair i think it's it's hopefully going to come to that that's what that's what i think like you know financial auditing is an example of an area that's very clear what a financial audit means and um we're not there yet with algorithmic auditing and there's kind of you know a fairly manual process that we you know we went through we also did another audit with an io psychology professor going through our training sets and making sure training sets have you know balanced demographics things like that um i i think yeah the the kind of mathematical standards have not been established so a lot of that is um taking people who understand the problem and kind of assessing um but but by my hope is that there will in the future be more um, more of kind of a typical process or standards that are widely accepted. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Like we have HIPAA laws, we have GDPR, um, but it's almost you know, a free for all in some ways where the companies govern themselves. Uh, do any of you foresee like any more, whether it's the US, the European Union, global um, standards starting to come out? Yeah, I mean, I would, I couldn't point to specifics because I'm not kind of buried in the policy of all this, but I think, I think it's inevitable. Um, but I do think what's important, and I do believe there should be standards, but I do think it's important that it doesn't become a kind of checkbox, you know, to say the ethical standards in and of themselves, just, just to conceive of them, it's difficult, right? Because we have a relativity built in here. Um, and so I think alongside standards there absolutely needs to be some kind of on regulated ongoing vigilance um you know when we think about what we're trying to do here we've just been talking about hiring ai um i mean that is a in, you know, something that's always been done by humans by the human brain which is infinitely complex there are tons and tons of things going on that we can barely understand when a human makes a hiring decision and we're trying to simplify and quantify that right and, and turn it into something that we can mechanize and um i think you know we can in some instances and we can make it fairer in some instances but i think there has to be a recognition that we don't know everything yet and um, really intensive vigilance on an ongoing basis by anybody who's using or deploying AI in a way that it touches human lives, which is everybody who uses it. Um, and to also follow up on what Fiona uh, talked about, so there are some regulations coming out. Then, you know, the proposed um, EU AI regulation that um, came out recently. Um, so that brings some clarification in terms of how we should view um, as practitioners uh, about different use cases that we are working on, you know, the way that they specify things like high risk use cases, right? So now we know what they consider high risk and what are the, um, you know, from their point of view, what are the requirements? Uh, whether, for example, you need to have conformity with certain um, aspects, that, that actually brings some clarity for industry. Uh, in a sense that, you know, it's not every company doing, as you mentioned, their own uh, type of governance and um, evaluation, but now you might have a more standard way of uh, viewing the process. Yeah, uh, great and fascinating. Um, and, and Fiona, you, kind of following up on some of where you were headed with like human behavior and uh, what we're talking about uh, psychology, like are human habits fun fundamentally changing? and if so, how can AI nudge this changing behavior? I mean, yeah, I think so. Right? That, you know, this is um, technology is just in our lives that for those of us who can remember kind of pre-internet and, and, and the incredible rate of change that we've seen over the last sort of 20 years or so has, has already changed our lives hugely. And yeah, and I think like one of the things I write about is how we need to be mindful of how it changes human behaviors and, and how we can try to be certain about those 
behavior changes being positive things. Um, so, you know, AI ultimately and machine learning is, is used you know, predominantly to, to make decisions or to guide decisions. And uh, in, a, in most cases, those decisions are things that have been taken kind of by the human brain or in a much more manual way. And so, yeah, I mean, we are now sort of in a position where there are those that know and hold data and understand AI and how to deploy it. And there's a huge number of people who don't, and just regular people who get up in the morning, brush their teeth and get on with their lives. Uh, and there's a massive information imbalance there, right? And so I, I think it's really important in thinking about um, deploying AI is the influence that we can have on those people, how we can make decisions that determine whether they get credit or whether they go to jail or whether they get a place at college. Um, and also, you know, AI is deployed constantly in a way which shepherds their decision making, whether it's buying behaviors or uh, other decisions that they may take in their lives. And um, I think makers and those that use AI need to be really mindful of this as they create systems um, that touch these lives. And, um, and also, uh, not just mindful, but they need to over communicate about how it's being used. I think a lot of fear around AI is based on uh, a lack of understanding and a lack of transparency. And so I do think there's a big communications piece here as well, that companies need to be open and honest about how they're doing things, how they're trying and sometimes failing and um, to go that extra length to reassure people in, in what honestly are quite uncertain times for a lot of people. Absolutely. Any Anyone have other thoughts on that? Um, I'll, I'll say that I think I notice how AI nudges my own behavior and my like how I consume information. Um, you know, I can scroll through headlines for an hour and hardly read a full article. And um, and this is why I've, I've never even like played with TikTok because I've heard that it's so addictive. I don't even want to see it, you know, and I think and it's because their algorithms are so good. Um, I, in terms of that, I you know, and this that's kind of a specific area, but it, it does lead to these um, information bubbles and um, you know, a lot of, and contributes to a lot of the division that we, we probably are, you know, are seeing, um, especially politically in the U S but, uh, so, so I think it's scary. I might be overly optimistic about, um, you know, kind of what we, we demand as consumers. I, I think we, we are seeing a lot of kind of pushback to how we're spent, you know, how our attention has been hijacked and you have things like Apple showing you how much screen time you used and kind of kind of helping you as an individual. You have to you have to be aware and you have to kind of set your your goals. But how do I want to spend my time and what how are these day to day habits contributing to that? And there are a lot of, you know, like any technology can be used for good or bad. And and, I, and so I'm kind of hopeful that we're, we'll move in that direction and say, like, I want I want my life back and I don't want to be staring at screens too many hours a day and then um you know and that technology can actually help us uh help us kind of regulate that as well great yeah uh, i don't know about you all but i do uh, yeah i am a social media kind of junkie so i have gone down the TikTok route and it's so different for every person like it kind of knows my tastes every time you review a video or hit like it's kind of like um in the retail world uh, next best offer like it knows what movie you like but like netflix was great since it knew what movie you liked and could recommend another movie um so in some ways it, it's good and um yeah i'm cur curious if anyone else uh uses it but uh or, or any of you had any thoughts on uh, uh on the last couple of subjects um oh <laughs> I wouldn't say that I use social media since uh, generally I'm not part of that. But, you know, what for the example that you mentioned, you know, uh, it definitely, as Fiona and Lindsay talked about, it definitely changes our behavior, you know, the type of news that we see, the type of movies that's recommended to us. Uh, it's good that it's, um, you know, customized to our uh, interests and our uh, kind of what we enjoy, but at the same time, uh, it can be viewed as narrowing the point of view. 
you're limited to what you're now uh, they're recommending to you. You are not seeing, for example, uh, different news outlets or different type of news um, or different type of movies that you know you might have been able to be exposed to in the past, but now you're solely limited. For example, if you're interested in sci-fi, you're now only uh, getting sci-fi recommendations. Yeah, I think that's really true, and uh, you know. Um, and the same with this kind of information bubbles that we get trapped in. And you've got to wonder, you know, like it makes, it's making people potentially more exaggerated versions of themselves. Like you say, sort of sci-fi nuts become super sci-fi nuts, you know, to give it, to give the same example. Um, and, you know, typically we've conceived of a character, I'm kind of speaking as someone who's studied philosophy now, but character is, uh, potentially, a lot of people think it's derived from the choices that we make, so my hairstyle or where I went to college or where I go on vacation or what brand of tomatoes I buy. Um, and if you have an algorithm kind of shepherding those choices or narrowing those choices, as um, Hanio says, then in, to a degree, are these algorithms shaping who I am in the world? You know, they, deter they start kind of being customized to my wants and needs and start to maybe determine my wants and needs in a way that actually dictates my character and how I behave and who I am um, which is you know interesting from a philosophical perspective but I think also something that and I, and I agree with Lindsay I think it's something that increasingly um, and having taught at a college not too long ago um, young people particularly are becoming aware of and they're they're understanding that you know certain algorithms and the TikToks and the Facebooks and the Instagrams of this world do have a kind of manipulatory power over them that they must you know kind of seek to resist. Unfortunately, not all of them, but um, I, I believe the message is kind of slowly filtering out. Yeah, I, I went to uh, the school uh, Caltech, um, known in the Big Bang Theory, and our motto was "The truth shall set you free." And I'm uh, old enough that I, I lived before the internet, and my big hope was wow, everyone around the world can communicate freely without having to write letters to the editor. Like everyone can speak their mind. So the top ideas flow to the top and the truth sets the world free and will be like this utopian uh, future. And then, yeah, especially the last couple of years, uh, you know, you all said it fairly like we, uh, you know, it's kind of going into everyone's echo chamber of uh, uh, content that kind of supports what, what they do. And I make an effort to listen and, and and hear different points of view and go to different media from around the world, um, but not everybody does. So it'll be you know really fascinating to see uh, you know it's a kind of a divisive world for many people now. But what might that look like? So I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that or like you know maybe we can start with the the, the positives. Like what if you do AI ethically? What what are some examples that you see today or uh, you know hopefully soon of use cases like higher view <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't mean to focus too much on, on my use case but i think i think uh you know something that comes up for me is just improving upon the past um rather than looking for the perfect solution um we we deal with a broken system which is hiring which is really hard to tackle um most of our customers they often have hundreds or even thousands of applications for a job so i know this from my personal experience when i left academia and applied for a job that i would spend all this time in these applicant tracking systems and then it's just like a black hole never hear anything back right um and really you're you're randomly they're randomly ignoring 90 percent of the people because the volume is just too high um and when they when they aren't you have all sorts of biases that aren't even measured aren't even questioned we're not really peering into the human brain and trying to figure out you know we're a lot we're a lot harder on algorithms to try to figure out what algorithms are doing than we than we've ever been able to with with the human brain um so i i think you know kind of there's a for me there's this idea of fairness or standardization of like for example allowing all of those people to be assessed in a, in the same way which is fair but you have to be very careful with what that is because it could it could just be narrowing the pool to a certain type of person 
or um, you know, looking for people that you've seen in the past, or it could not be very robust to understanding differences between people um, and how how different ways of people expressing themselves can can be positive, right? So I think um, so I think you know, keeping all those things in mind and kind of um, I'm fairly optimistic, although I, like like I said, every technology has um, harms and benefits. So it's just going into it with the attitude of, of applying things in the right way and considering who gets affected and how. Great. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's true. And I think that um I mean I often, because of what I do, I, I can seem like a bit of a Luddite and a naysayer when it comes to AI. And I'm really not. And I am I am also an optimist. And I think one of the things that's really great um and and you know, Lindsay, speaking to what you're saying about you know humans having incredible <laughs> biases right across the board, uh, but, you know, in many, many, many different ways. Um, I think what is great is having this ability to take vast swathes of data to understand things that really are kind of imperceptible to the human brain uh, or, or psyche, and and produce um suggestions and decisions that cause us to challenge our own perceptions that make us rethink um our initial instinctive reactions which are, might be biased in one way or another to begin with and i think having that as a tool to use um is invaluable and i think can in the long run be um you know chain i mean nothing but positive so long as it's managed in the way that we're all talking about now Great. Uh, Anya? <laughs> Sorry, I was going to give a quick example um, that I think is interesting. So a question um, that often comes up for us is when you transcribe speech to text, how accurate are you with people with different accents, right? And so this is obviously an issue and and, and the vendors in the space have improved in incredibly in the last few years. So when we went out to the market a few years ago, it was pretty typical that a lot of these vendors had 20, 25% word error rate. So they're missing a lot of things people are saying in normal speech. Now it's single digits. So just within a few years, it's incredible. And 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 this transcription that we're using now just blows me away. I've tried it, tried to break it with any anyone I know that has a really thick accent. And I'm like, gosh, it still does really, really well on accents. But um, what I think kind of speaking to this topic is, you know, in, in theory, depending on the training data, the speech to text algorithm should be able to be better than a human at understanding many different kinds of accents. Um, and I don't know that anyone's really done that research concretely, but the idea is, um, you know, you live in your area of the world, you've only been exposed to so many accents regularly. We all know that we, we have, a lot of us have our personal, like I just have a really hard time understanding that particular accent. Um, so if the training data is right, the power is there for AI to really do a lot better. And then on top of that, the AI has no judgments of people because of their accent. Um, so thinking, well, like, no, I don't think that person sounds very smart um, because they're from that area of the world or that area of the country, um, that the AI doesn't have any of that built in. So that's just an example to kind of speak to that power. Great. Uh, honey, any uh, positive? Uh... Um, just kind of to echo what uh, Fiona and Lindsay mentioned, I will just add that, um, you know, when you're thinking about it, we shouldn't think about in terms of, oh, we found the solution. No, it's always about improving. There is no one improvement that, you know, we fix the whole thing. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a continuous improvement in the process that we always need to evaluate ourselves. We always need to find because over time we find new issues, you know, something that at this point in time we didn't encounter or, you know, um, it wasn't discussed, so it's unknown to us. Maybe after a year or two, a new a, a, um, kind of concerns might come out. And we always need to kind of evaluate ourselves and try to push it further. Yeah, good, good point. It's like, uh, how, do, how do you improve without getting to perfect? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, yeah, then and anyone, it's all voluntary, like we talked about, positive, utopian, um, uh, you don't have to, but anyone have any uh, dystopian or negative 
uh, you know, effects of AI that we should be aware of or try to avoid? I mean, <laughs> I have run a blog that thinks <laughs> that writes about anything I can find that I think we should be we should be cautious of. But I, I honestly, I don't want to be kind of dystopic about this. I think, um, you know, we, we've talked about influence, and I think that is one of my main concerns as someone who writes about this, who's kind of from the outside looking in, is is just undue influence as we. As AI gets better, we're going to trust it more and more, and we're going to relinquish lots of the things. This is what happens with technology. This is not anything new, but the the pace at which it's coming at us and the ubiquity of this particular technology means necessarily that it's going to have a greater impact. I think we can all see that now. And so as we sit back and we start to relinquish decision making to um, AI, I, I, I mean, I'm I'm actually very gratified that there are so many people now thinking about how we maintain a watch uh, to make sure that we don't give away um, more than we should and we maintain a grasp that kind of human in the loop to ensure that the technology functions for us and in our best interests um, but yeah I mean like, like I say we've spoken about influence and um, and I think as particularly as uh, the ways in which we interact with technology moves to different devices, to different platforms, and I'm thinking about augmented and virtual realities, which are much more immersive. Um, uh, I think, you know, perhaps more work needs to be thought about and um, needs to be done in terms of uh, more thinking needs to be done in terms of um, psychological impact and um, and yeah, and how it's going to continue to change us and how we can kind of mitigate where, it, where we need to. Great. And uh, where can we find your blog? Where are you right oh, now? Uh, it's youthedata.com. Um, so, yeah, take a look. <laughs> I, I took a look. It's great. We, we Thank you for the shout out. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else want to chime in on like concerns of, of, of where things might be headed? Um, I would say that I honestly, I don't have any concerns in these regards because. Um, there has been a lot of awareness in this area and companies are both the public sector as well as the private sector. They're really um, now thinking about what they can do in order to um, bring responsible use of technology in their workflow and ensuring that the process is ethical. So in this regard, I don't have concerns around that, but rather, you know, it's a positive trend that we are seeing right now. Um, the speed may not be as fast as that, but we want it to be uh, because, you know, we talked about it before. There are a lot of complexities in the process. It's not easy to plug in ethics and uh, everything is now fine. But, uh, you know, it's it's a very positive trend. Uh, it's slow, but uh, in a good di in the in, in the right direction. Yeah, I would agree that five years ago, data scientists did not know about this. <laughs> like most people, I, I feel like that's, it was kind of when we started thinking about it really seriously at higher view, but um, it was not, you know, part of the data science education. Um, and I think now it has, has become that in most cases. Great. Yeah, and having been a data scientist, it was easy. It, it was hard to like have time to think about things sometimes where you had like such a long list of things to do. You would just make a model and move on. Uh, your boss is asking you for the next model for the next insight. And yeah, so it's it's hard, but um, yeah, these days, you know, I see more and more tools and thoughts around it and concerns um, and, and, and opportunities too. And from that, uh, we got another question from the audience. So thank you and keep the questions coming. Uh, so the question is, people can be biased and unethical are you aware of any studies on how AI biases and fairness compare with the human um, bias and fairness? And and if so, and if the AI biases are like less to a degree than humans, then should we trust uh, put our trust in AI more? I mean, I think there are tons of studies that that look at human biases, and I'm, I'm, I I couldn't point to any in particular. I, I think from my perspective. Um, my worry is that if uh, a hiring manager, so this we're talking about hiring, is is 
horribly prejudiced and biased, then, then that's one person. Whereas if we have a system that has even one tiny instance of bias in it, and that is scaled and used by multiple companies across multiple different places and in different institutions, then we have a, a much bigger problem. Um, you know, humans are not perfect. And, and as I said previously, there are um, in, incredible biases. Actually, when you study psychology, you, you learn all about these. Um, and I don't believe that AI is uh, ever going to be some perfect solution, as Hanaya said earlier, but I do think that um, it is still important to try and get as close to perfection as we can, right? Because we're talking about systems that are going to be rolled out um, and not just one person making a judgment about another. It's, it's, it's the scale that, that is the concern. Yeah, we have, um, I think we, we have a paper submitted right now, which may have some real data and it's a little hard for us to share data on our customers that makes them look biased, but, you know, um, but from, from just anecdotally, what I've seen is, is yes, mathematically we can remove bias that's in the data. And, and again, this is a nuanced topic, but um, if we have a data set, even a training set with, big group differences, um, people um, in ethnic groups or age or gender were, were judged very differently by humans. Um, we, can, we can build that into the, into the algorithm that we're not gonna allow that to happen. So it's essentially, you know, you're not, you're any, any kind of behaviors or in our case language that differentiates, for, for example, men from women, like we're not looking at that because it causes this problem on the out, outcome. So, so you, you know, you can audit and you can say, um, you know, automatically hide those things from us. So for example, like women talk about childcare more, any mention of childcare should be ignored by the algorithm essentially. And that, but that's, that's part of the optimization. So we've seen it a lot just in our day-to-day -day work that, that humans have bias um, for whatever reason that is, like that can be, that can be explicit bias. It can be that just underrepresentation in the data or kind of bad luck in the training data for whatever it is. We don't want the algorithm to to further um, to, to further that down the road. So so you know the, those mathematical tools can be really strong to kind of get rid of that. And then and then as as was mentioned, you know just continually checking to see how how it behaves in the wild because the group of individuals in the wild may evolve over time and they may look different than the training set. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. And to echo both uh, what Fiona and Lindsay mentioned, you know, uh, Lindsay talked about, uh, Fiona talked about the, um, the scale that if AI is biased, it can have a much higher scale rather than just one person being biased. And kind of Lindsay talked on the mitigation side of it. Uh, but there are ways that you can, if you're using an algorithm, you can um, use mitigation in order to reduce bias in the system. So, you know, that actually kind of shows us that it's much harder to try to reduce bias in humans. It takes decades and centuries to uh, work on, uh, on ourselves. Uh, but at least when it comes to algorithm, it's much easier for us because we're dealing with math. We know how to handle um, and try to reduce bias um, in the algorithms uh, so that's one thing to think about you know uh, of, there is this fear um, of AI being biased and of course it can scale up but at the same time it also gives us a chance of being able to correct the system much faster and much easier than uh, let's say correcting all the human beings well, great and yeah as we're talking another question came in from the audience um, it's a good one uh, it's always tough to predict where things are headed, but where do you feel the most impactful advances in AI will be in the next five years? This may be more than five years out, but I'm really excited about um, kind of how AI will affect wellness and healthcare. Uh, I think there's a lot of promise there and it's been really hard to kind of get it off the ground because the data is such a mess and it's so incomplete. Um, so that's something I'm looking forward to, you know, having a sensor that tells me to eat broccoli, <laughs> which I should probably just eat broccoli every day anyway, or, you know, like, but, but it would be very nice to kind of have more awareness of what's going on in your body, what's going on with your health, being able to predict things 
really long term. Um, my dad was just diagnosed with Parkinson's, and one of, we were at the doctor yesterday, and one of the things I we brought up is his he hasn't had a sense of smell for like 20 years, and the doctor was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's that's an early indicator. Um, decades ahead of the diagnosis, and I thought that's just that's such an interesting thing because of course it could be something else, but there's so much that we don't know about what diseases look like decades ahead of time, and um, and I think that that's a area that's really ripe for for being transformed by AI. One example of that is actually uh, what we saw with COVID, you know, how AI actually helped uh, uh, help us with, you know, the forecasting of uh, the spread of COVID and being able to use that as a force of, you know, bring, bringing the, um, whether it's testing or the vaccines for trial. So, we, you know, it shows us this, this is, you know, this can be the future, how we can use AI in order, you know, to be able to improve our lives, basically. Yeah, I completely agree. I think health is the real big one uh, and, you know, for obvious reasons. And I think there's some really, really interesting work being done. But, you know, there's some interesting stuff in agriculture and um, the uh, helping um, developing countries allocate resources. I mean, the list goes on, really, and, and the incredible um, ways in which AI can be used to improve um, the lot of humans globally. And, you know, and it's exciting times, you know, we're right at the beginning of this stuff and you only have to attend an AI conference virtually these days to and listen to some of, um, you know, new upcoming startups pitching their ideas and explaining where they think they're going um, to realise that I think, you know, the, there's a good cause for optimism in terms of what, what the capabilities are here. Yeah, you know, you know, the next five years or the next 10 or 15 even, like all, all of humanity, in my opinion, is going to be very, very different. Um, I, I, I do. Uh, I am a co-host of More Intelligent Tomorrow. It's this podcast where we get futurists. We had um, Dr. Lee Hood, who created the Human uh, Genome Initiative, you know, sequencing the human DNA, and Ben Huang, um, Prof USA. That like the the ability to detect diseases and uh, wellness, um, and and uh, is changing so quickly that you know some of them think we could. You know, unless you get in an accident, live to be multiple hundreds of years old, um, and not in a sci-fi book in actual real life. But then to contain Earth, to sustain it, you know, the other thing is space travel, and that's a, a bit of a bit of a challenge for five years. But eventually, that that's something that AI can uh, definitely help with as well. And then, um, yeah, and and don't don't let me kill that. If people have other thoughts and ideas. Let's keep riffing, but I, I'm getting a few other questions. Um, this was touched on a, a bit, but who should be held accountable or responsible for AI ethics? Or if I could add in to that question, like who should be part of the conversation? Uh, so well, in terms I, of business or, sorry, go ahead, Hannah. Um, so I was about to say that um, all the stakeholders should be uh, part of the conversation. And when it comes to accountability, there's not only one person, you know, we have, you know, as we talked about, we have the whole life cycle. So at any point, someone's touching the system, whether if it's, you know, data collection part of it, ideation side of it, even before we actually see any data, uh, the way that we define the problem, the, all the way to when it's deployed, um, so throughout the process, we need to have an accountability system the same way that we have governance. Uh, we have accountability on that side and, you know, that way we would be able to uh, kind of hold people accountable at their, uh, you know, if their parties are having some issues. Yeah, I mean, literally, exactly, exactly, just echoing that. And, you know, I think, uh, I actually think that increasingly there's going to be a need to have somebody within each organization who holds, you know, holds the keys on this um, and it might be somebody who already deals with data privacy or security but I, I think if we sort of sit back and let it be everybody's responsibility it very quickly becomes nobody's responsibility because everybody has busy lives and jobs and they have other things to think about but I think um, organizations working in this space need to be thinking about who 
is you know the person who's going to crack the whip internally on this and make sure that initiatives aren't kind of nice little things that go in one ear and out the other and actually are baked into um, business strategies and, and such like. Great. Well, just looking at the time, and John, I don't know if you wanted to come back at the end, but um, let, let's uh, you know go through like the you know final wrap up of. Uh, you know, anything that you wanted to say that I didn't ask or any uh, concluding thoughts? And we'll go last name, reverse order this time. Uh, so, uh, Lindsay. Oh, no. <laughs> um, no, I don't think I have too much to add. I think, you know, um, we covered we covered a lot of really great stuff. And, and um, obviously, I have kind of my area that I probably dominated a little too much talking about, but I thought it was really interesting to kind of talk generally as well and hear the other panelists, so thank you. Well, thank you, and Fiona? No, I, I, I would agree. I think it was a great kind of discussion. We covered a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, ground there. I, I, would, I would simply say, you know, I think there, as I said, good reason for optimism, um, but also caution, let's not overestimate what AI can do, and let's just be mindful of that. Great. Yeah, same like uh, Lindsay and Fiona. It's uh, you know it was a very interesting conversation, and uh, you know I think we can all agree that this is a complex problem. Uh, uh, so we shouldn't expect that there is a you know a very simple solution out there that we just need to um, find it. But rather we need to think about how we can um, use what's out there in terms of frameworks and bring it to our organization and adjust it to what's uh, relevant to the work that we are doing. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. Uh, this seemed to go pretty quickly for me, hopefully uh, excitingly for you. And uh, thank you. And then John, looks like you're coming back on to wrap it up. But thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this was phenomenal. And it was very interesting kind of being behind the scenes here, because as questions were coming in, it seemed like a lot of the questions from the audience, um, th there's a lot of uncertainty and maybe some uneasiness about the future of AI and, and where things are going. And I really love the optimism um, from, from all of you as to the positives and, and what we need to focus on and, and where things are gonna go. So it was really refreshing to hear a really, really positive and, and optimistic viewpoint towards the future of AI. So thank you so much, Ari, for, for setting this up, Hani, Fiona, and uh, Lindsay for, for being involved, this was great. Um, to everybody out there, um, this this um, webinar is recorded and was recorded, so you'll, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, be receiving an automated email uh, probably sometime early next week. Um, so if you wanna re, uh, re see it or share it with any of your colleagues or anyone, please, please feel free. Um, thanks again for joining us. Thanks again, everyone, uh, all my panelists uh, for being involved and um, keep an eye out for our next installment uh, of the Analytics Enthusiast coming out uh, sometime in October. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Everyone Thanks, have a great guys. rest of your day. Bye.